Okay, so I'm going to begin today with a land acknowledgement. The sociability of sleep is located, physically located in Jajage, Montreal, and is situated on the traditional and unceded territories of the Gahaka. We recognize with gratitude that they are the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we meet, live, and rest. Jajage has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations, including the Ganigahaga of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wondat, Abenaki, and Anishinaabeg peoples. Um, I'll also briefly share an acknowledgement developed by the feminist media studio Equicordia for our pandemic forms of assembly. While Zoom, a company that's exploded in value during the pandemic, is the technical custodian of the platform in which we gather, this makes us no less occupants of the multiple territories on which we are physically located. Zoom's headquarters are located on Muwekma Ohlone territory, and the Ohlone have historically understood about sustainability, about communal societies, about giving gifts to those who pass by, and about sharing space. And their horizontal organization might inspire different emergent models of peer-to-peer -peer networking in the pandemic than those that we're enacting here in Zoom. So we see Zoom as a platform which connects us and which alienates us from the aims of restitution, justice, and reparation. I'd also like to acknowledge that the sociability of sleep is funded by um, support from the Government of Canada's New Frontiers in Research Fund on our website, and we'll share a link to that in the chat. Uh, you can find out more about upcoming events, including our graduate research colloquium coming up at the end of this month, also on Zoom, our future sleep salons. We have four more coming this, uh, this semester and what our researchers are up to. Please reach out if you're interested in learning more or collaborating, and you can also follow us on Facebook or on social media to keep up with project events. So thanks again for taking time to be with us here today. During the salon, please feel free to use the chat to share your thoughts and comments and relevant links that today's discussion raises for you. There'll be a Q&A after our speakers who will each speak for about 25 minutes. Um, and we'll be taking a speakers list in the chat uh, and then inviting you to open your mics and ask your own questions. Today's conversation will take place in English, but please feel free to make uh, comments or ask questions in French as well. And we're happy to translate. So I turn now to our speakers. Today's speakers are looking at an issue that's been a major driver of the last 40 years of research into sleep, its connection to labor and to workers. Um, I'll introduce them before they'll speak for about 25 minutes and then we'll have questions. Our first speaker today is Sarah Barnes, an assistant professor in the Department of Experiential Studies and Community and Sport at Cape Breton University. Her research focuses on athlete welfare in a rapidly changing society, and she created several manuscripts that explore how sleep enhancing products and technologies are taken up in athletic settings. Barnes is a former basketball player and coach and has experience working in grassroots, university, and international sports. So without further ado, Professor Sarah Barnes. All right, thank you everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. I'm, thank you to Alana, Alex, Charlene, Joshua, and other people behind the scenes who have made these seat salons possible. Uh, I'm zooming in from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, uh, which is the ancestral and unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq territory peoples. And I moved here in the fall and I've been learning slowly about the peace and friendship uh, treaties which were signed with the British Crown in 1725. And I'm so thrilled to be here uh, in preparing for today's sessions. I went back and sort of viewed the previous sessions. Uh, I have a teaching conflict, so I haven't been able to be there in person. And I've just felt really inspired and sort of reanimating um, my love for this topic. And I'm really excited to learn more about Dr. Skane's uh, extensive scientific research and sort of problem solving around uh, biology and work. So I just wanted to begin with an outline of what I've organized today. Uh, I'm gonna start by describing the larger project from which this paper is derived and really trying to think about how and why sleep is framed as the solution to exhausting sports systems. This will involve discussions of sleep technologies, sport focused sleep science, uh, and some of the ethical and political issues at play. And finally, I'll share some thoughts on the broader implications of these trends, 
for what it means to imagine collective care for sleepers in a moment when muscular notions of high performance sleep are in circulation. So I'm a, I wanted to situate myself first as a scholar. Uh, I'm a feminist cultural studies of sport researcher, and I wrote a dissertation about the history of ideas of sleep as a tool for athletic training. When I was selecting my dissertation topic, I was working with Canada Basketball in the Women's National Team Program. And so I traveled as a team manager internationally, and I found myself in a lot of conversations with athletes about recovery. I'd often also in this role, uh, lay out daily schedules, inclusive of meal and nap times, and tried to prepare younger athletes, some of whom had never been on an airplane before, about what it might feel like to have jet lag and to perform well despite feeling tired. And there was also a, a lot of laundry involved in this. During my coursework, um, I had the good fortune of being assigned the book by Matthew Wolfmeyer, The Sunburn Masses. And in this book, there was this fascinating case study of the Vendee Globe, which is a prestigious, very prestigious, nonstop solo global race. It usually runs about two months long. And athletes go to extreme measures to really will down their daily sleep in order to maximize their awake time for, for their athletic performance. And so it's almost very much a throwback to the late 19th century pedestrianism six day bicycle races and other endurance contests that captivated the masses and have been beautifully written about by sport historians. But because of my work and background in sport, I could see that there were other more varied and perhaps contradictory ideas and practices in the athletic realm. For instance, many of the athletes I knew were practicing some version of what Stanford sleep researcher Sherry Ma refers to as sleep extension. This involves athletes sleeping 10 or more hours a night. This schedule has been somewhat popularized by LeBron James, who's an NBA superstar who spends upwards of 1.5 million annually to prepare his body for competition. Overall, I was really fascinated by questions about player welfare and the day-to-day -day governance of athletes. I wanted to expand conversations around sleep to better account for social difference and inequality. I felt compelled to understand how pressures on sleep and sport had broader ramifications. And the key was moving away from the notion of sport as innocent or apolitical. And this opened up sp space to see the spectacle of mass mediated celebrity sport as a realm that shapes popular notions of how tired bodies might be managed. A context where you're only as valuable as your last performance, a place where racial, gender, economic lines are drawn, contested, and haunted by colonial and slave systems, a site where notions of human capacity and bodily potential are defined and made anew. And I'm very happy to talk about the dissertation and the discussion, but for now I'd like to focus on the topic at hand, sleep, labor, and athletic performance. So in the lead up to the 2012 Rio Olympic Games, US Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps slept in a high altitude bed chamber. By mimicking the conditions of high altitude, Phelps forced his body to work overtime as he slept. In theory, by breathing thinner air, that is air with lower oxygen content, Phelps's body would adjust and become more efficient in its transportation of oxygen and potentially giving him an advantage over his competitors. In 2012, this practice might have seemed extreme. About 10 years later, it's actually a lot more common than you might think in high performance settings. The example, however, is important because it also offers entry into thinking about the larger cultural phenomenon. Today, sleep has become a, if not the central ingredient upon which the production of athleticism, especially at the elite levels, is thought to hinge. There's a perception that it's no longer enough to work hard for three or four hours a day on the court, in the gym, the weight room, or the yoga studio. To excel in today's sport climate, athletes must also maximize their off hours. Sleep is in its own right, something to excel and work hard at. This rationale underpins a variety of novel interests and interventions into athlete sleep. Sports writers refer to sleep as a secret weapon, a smart investment. Most, if not all professional sports teams and Olympians work with sleep scientists and recovery coaches. 
support organizations, pour money into sleep optimizing products, services, and partnerships. A nice example of this is that in 2018, Sleep Number, the maker of the 360 Smart Bed, became an official health and wellness sponsor of the NFL. And 1,600 um, NFL players were gifted biometric beds. The WNBA and the NBA have partnerships with a smart ring company called Aura Health. This is a silicon tech startup that invites athletes to wear, in their words, the equivalent of a sleep laboratory on their finger. A $28 million locker room renovation for the football team at Louisiana State University equips each student athlete with a state-of-the-art sleep pod in the locker room. Despite sleep compromising nature, the, despite the sleep compromising nature of their work, athletes have become highly visible symbols of a promotional sleep culture. From pajamas to bed sheets, from mattresses to melatonin lace drinks, there's a good chance an athlete is involved in the marketing and promotion of these products. And the argument that I advance here is that efforts to optimize athlete sleep are not, as might be assumed, simply an innocent or benevolent athlete-friendly development. This is not to deny that individual athletes may benefit from sleeping more or better, at least in the short term. But in the long term, interventions around athlete sleep often create new forms of surveillance, bolster efforts to control athletes' behaviors and bodies for profits. And as we'll see, a sleep optimizing sport industry is helping to shift the responsibility for getting good sleep to individual athletes. And meanwhile, performance and profit models escape scrutiny as the underlying values, beliefs, and expectations of unending productivity remain undisturbed. And these dynamics have implications for how athletes and non-athletes come to participate in discourses of sleep labor and performance as good citizens. So the conditions of modern sport are really exhausting. And there are frequently experiences of fatigue, overtraining, exhaustion, lost or restricted sleep, and jet lag. Sometimes I think ideas about human progress and human mastery make it easy to forget that these experiences are not accidental. It's exhaustion by design. Sports scientists writing in the 1980s and 1990s, for example, observed that most elite athletes were chronically fatigued and should expect to be for their athletic careers. Modern training techniques established in places like the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory in the 1920s and 1930s, cultivate, and then cultivated through the athletic intensities and rivalries of the Cold War, are founded on an assumption that it's necessary to overload and stress the body in, over, in order to provoke positive biological adaptations. So athletes and coaches are asked to walk this this tightrope, they constantly have to push, but not go too far. If any of you follow the NBA, uh, you might be familiar with a crisis that emerged out of the practice of strategically benching star players to save them for big games. And on your screen, there's some headlines um, pictured but that were connected to that sort of problem. And so resting star players, really disappointed fans, threatened TV ratings, and so as you can see, corporate sponsors, television contracts, ticket holders, stadium sales, merchandising, and this quest for records and entertainment must also be factored in as constraints on rest and labor and sport. And I guess if I had to like characterize my research, it would be sort of to notice how the negotiation about the limits of the athletic body have become rather fraught in an era of sleep positivity to use the term of Simon Williams. And so last I checked, it's sort of always changing, but there's a $585 billion global sleep industry. And the work of historians, sociologists, including Megan Brown, Stephen Carl Smith, Simon Williams, Kenton Croker, Matthew Wolfmeyer, among others, have really helped to shape, have really helped to map out how um, late 20th century social forces connected to public health, the medical establishment, capitalism, the sleep laboratory, corporate America, big pharma, 
and the sleep advocacy organizations crystallized and helped to make historically specific ways of sleeping feel inevitable and natural. What I've been fascinated with is this growing cultural preoccupation with good sleep and its potential to support personal and collective flourishing. A lot of thinking has converged around this notion that good sleep has never been more elusive and difficult to obtain and yet never more valuable. There's a sense that everyone, even those who do not suffer from diagnosed sleep disorders, that they could benefit be from becoming their very best at sleeping. As the New York Times explains, sleep today is a measure of success, a skill to be cultivated and nourished. And all of this occurs at a moment of unprecedented technological development and new digital regimes that are not experienced by everyone in the same way, not simply in sport, but also in the wider culture. And of course, it must be said that this cultural fixation with good sleep contradicted longstanding American traditions, American Canadian, as well as probably UK traditions that devalue sleep. Sleep has often been seen as a waste of time, a form of indulgence, a sign of laziness, a barrier to a productive and full life. These ideas have often been put on display in dominant job culture, which is well known for being organized around racialized hypermasculinities and dominant work ethic. So an emerging generation of athletes who take sleep seriously and go to great lengths to pursue rest is a type of historical inversion that is quite captivating. Nevertheless, there have been surprisingly few discussions about labor, performance, and sleep at the highest levels of sport. So I wanna take this opportunity to highlight a few trends that I think deserve attention. Partly what I'm trying to draw out is how form the formations of celebrity sport really strengthen and naturalize historically specific ways of sleeping as optimal. And the type of sleep I'm thinking about here um, was really beautifully mapped out, sketched out by Ben Rees um, in one of the fall sleep salons. He points to this idea that this is an economically and environmentally costly way of sleeping, and it sort of has come to characterize a US-centric middle-class sleep. And it's often very fa often facilitated by technologies. So Rye Science is a technology company that has built a business on athlete sleep. Its founders were three undergraduate students at Northwestern, and they created a sleep tracking system that fits into an athlete's mattress. The NBA Chicago Bulls, the Tennessee and Clemson University football teams, and others have annual contracts with this company. Teams pay between about 40,000 and 100,000 US for services, educations, and technologies. And Rise also works with Tilo, which is another tech startup that specializes in text messaging. And they deliver personalized sleep coaching to elite athletes. I'm not sure if you can see on your screen, um, there's sort of a conversation there um, on somebody's cell phone that was captured, that captures what sleep coaching looks like. So 90 minutes before bed, athletes receive a text message on their phone to remind them to put on their special glasses that block blue light. And those are pictured on your screen as well. Another notification lets them know that it's time for bed, at which point players are supposed to get into bed alone, You're supposed to don a sleep mask, shut the blinds, and set the room temperature to 62 to 67 degrees. Data generated from biometric sleep trackers um, are then transferred to a team's computer or server. Every morning, coaches receive a report that states the team's readiness and notes any potential high-risk athletes who did not fully recover through nighttime sleep. Athletes also receive their personal sleep data on their phones. And so sleep tracking, however, is not just about internet-connected beds, though those are very popular. It's also about automating athletes through wearable technologies. So Fatigue Science is a Vancouver-based company, and they work across many different industrial, corporate, military, and athletic settings. Its ReadyBand technology is a risk technology, and it pairs with a biomathematical formula developed by the US military 
to measure sleep fatigue and alertness. This company really focuses on education for coaches and players. It also offers travel schedule analysis, sleep screening, biweekly or monthly team assessments. Similar to smart beds, fatigue science delivers immediate quantitative feedback to the player's phone and coaching stacks. Athletes also are provided with daily and hourly fatigue predictions and text notifications about the impact of sleep on performance. And so what we can start to see is that these devices um, really, oh, sorry, these devices actually um, enable monitoring of athletes away from the court and field. And they blur the lines about when the workday ends or begins, if ever. It shifts responsibilities for being well rested to athletes and deflects attention away from social and structural forces that produce tiredness. In the commercial realm, the science and technology behind these trends are often shrouded in secrecy and protected by business processes. It can be difficult to obtain prices or technical specificities. It's not clear how different companies conceptualize these complex states of fatigue, alertness, or recovery. And there are sort of a handful of sleep studies um, that are routinely routinely cited, but there's no sign of sort of engaging with, for example, the work of Luke Gupta, uh, Kevin Gilchrist, or Kevin Morgan and Sarah Gilchrist, a group of British sleep and sport physiologists who really highlight the gaps and inconsistencies that exist in our understanding of athlete sleep. So though the market certainly conveys a sense of athletes as occupying the sort of special and unique category of sleepers, if you look at research, things are a bit more ambiguous. Scientific interest in sleep has generally grown quite a bit from the 1980s and 1990s, but the field remains relatively, slow, relatively small and still is quite in its infancy. When it comes to getting a good night's rest, it's highly debatable if athletes face greater challenges than other groups who experience stress, say students taking an exam, or people who are, who are subject to heavy physical training, such as soldiers. A diverse range of study designs, sleep and exercise protocols, reporting standards, outcome variables, make it almost impossible to compare studies or to cultivate a full portrait of sleep patterns associated with sport participation. What's striking to me is how remarkably disconnected this literature feels from a broader sleep science that recognizes that access to high quality and sufficient sleep remains a type of social privilege. As seen in the work of Camilla Acontra, Judy Blanc, scientists featured uh, in earlier sleep salons, they are pushing to better understand how factors such as over, under, and precarious work, poverty, racism, historical trauma, and environmental stressors, including climate change, uh, need to be better accounted for in scientific and public discourse. The vagueness and lack of transparency, of course, also contradicts the fact that sleep devices make the lives of athletes hyper-visible. Bioethicists Katrina Carquez and Jennifer Fishman note that biometric devices that track sleep may reveal how late a player is out, whether he was drinking or speeding, or whether he had sex. These forms of surveillance are not only an ethical concern, it's not clear what happens to the streams of data, as sleep technologies also carry with them an entirely new potential to make athletes known to sport authorities and not always in the best of ways. Being known to sport authorities or any authority in our society has different implications along racial, gendered, sexual class lines. And sleep data is, is saturated with cultural valences. It fuels moral anxieties that separate and sort athletes into different groups. Within the highly racialized context of sport, historical and racist anxieties about the management of quote, risky African-American male athletes may be renewed through practices associated of monitoring sleep. Leagues like the NBA and the NFL, mainstream media and portions of different fan bases have a history of constructing back players 
is a problem that require constant oversight and management. And the desire to maintain and boost profits means that they can create campaigns, website content, promotional materials to counter such racist characterizations, and instead to portray their largely African-American playing forces as non-threatening, respectable, and productive. As fans continue to mourn the loss of Kobe Bryant, uh, we can also connect back to his, er, shortly after his retirement, when he appeared in the New York Times with Arianna Huffington, um, and he connected his newfound appreciation for sleep to his maturation as a father and man. The implicit messages here uh, that we see in similar athlete testimonials is that if you care about sleep and you have the right priorities, it's you're, you're on the right side of things, not only as an athlete, but also as a citizen. And athletes who do not properly appear to prioritize sleep may be labeled as irresponsible, selfish, or antisocial. And this is regardless uh, whether or not athletes have different sleep patterns due to grueling travel schedules or an inability to wind down after a game. So professional sports help to shape collective imaginations around labor and performance. Sleep, a once rather unremarkable bodily process, becomes something new to excel at or win at, in the words of a 2014 IKEA bedroom promotional campaign. Competitive discourses help to sleep strip, help to sleep, <laughs> help to strip sleep of its fleshiness, its spirituality, its pleasures. It becomes a rational tool to manage rather than to challenge excessive demands of the workplace. The mingling of athletic and sleep discourses can eclipse the shared humanity found in the need to rest, repair, and refresh. The instrumental understandings do not stay isolated in sport. The monitoring and optimizing of sleep has already sped beyond and will have different consequences for groups that are differently positioned in relation to the economy, social services, medical system and insurance models, and indeed sports systems, all of which increasingly incorporate data and cutting edge technologies within decision-making processes. It's a good thing when athletes' tiredness is acknowledged and respected. And I would not deny that efforts to promote sleep and sleep technologies could have positive effects. But what is clear is that no matter how personally committed these athletes might be to sleep well, structural impediments continue to shape their career their playing careers. In other sectors, we've seen adjustments. School boards that adopt later start, start times or workplaces that rotate schedules and allow body, the body more room to adjust around nighttime work. There are policies to reduce working hours in medical settings and options like telecommuting and work from home provide white collar workers with new kinds of flexibility. But conversations in sport rarely include ideas about reduced workloads, schedules, or travel. To invite athlete welfare, as so many sport organizations and teams claim to want, it's important to expand the terms of the conversation by addressing a broader range of issues that impact our sleeping and waking lives. In this broadening, we can gain tools and perspectives that may allow us to more adequately respond to the exhausting conditions of modern life without at the same time deepening inequalities. Thank you so much, Sarah. <clears throat> that was fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to discussing this further in the Q&A. It's a really timely kind of question, particularly I think as we've seen um, such a, a, a spate of athletes coming out as kind of newly vulnerable in the news um, in various kinds of ways. And I think it's a really important conversation to be having. I'll turn now to our next speaker, uh, Deborah Day Skeen. Surrey Distinguished Professor and Section Lead for Chronobiology at the University of Surrey. She has over 30 years of research experience studying the human circadian timing system and circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders as experienced by blind people, shift workers, and older people. And her team's findings have led to the optimization of melatonin and light as treatment strategies for circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorders. Currently, her main focus is studying the mechanisms linking circadian clocks, sleep, and metabolism in health, circadian disorders, and metabolic diseases, such um, faced by shift workers, type 2 diabetes, 
using liquid chromato chromatography, mass spectrometry, metabol metabolomics. Sorry, <laughs> a lot of technical terminology that I'm mm -hmm. unfamiliar with. Um, Professor Skeen is also past president of the European Biological Rhythm Society and past vice president of the European Sleep Research Society. She's a Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Awardee, an associate editor of the Journal of Sleep Research, and on the editorial board of Chronobiology International and Clocks in Sleep. I'll turn it over to Professor Skeen. Good, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. As you've probably gathered, I'm a biologist, so uh, it's going to be a very interesting discussion, which I welcome from you after this talk. Um, now, let me get the slides to work. Who's moving the slides? Um, boom, boom, boom. Let's try that page down. Here we go. So um, when you, uh, I should, I'll start again and say that um, uh, talking about sleep and labor, um, I've been asked to talk about shift work uh, and the health consequences of that and how we can possibly find solutions to some of these problems that shift workers have. And I also want to talk what are the current challenges in the research work field. Um, so you've got some options when you study shift workers. You can either study them in real life um, that has advantages and disadvantages. You can bring shift workers into the laboratory and study them there, or, or you can uh, do simulated shift work where you're using healthy volunteers. And, and we essentially look at all uh, these models because indeed um, you can answer different questions uh, with these different models. And before I go on, I want to acknowledge my mentor who started um, the shift work research uh, in Surrey over 35 years ago. Um, so essentially when we think about shift work, night shift work or rotating shift work, it's a misalignment between your biological timing system, your, your body clocks and um, your behavior and um, the, uh, the external clock. Uh, and just to spend a moment or two on what this biological timing system is, we know we have a sort of master clock here in the hypothalamus of the brain that we call the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And what's fascinating about this clock is that you can take it out of an animal and it's capable of independent oscillations, which you see here in this graph. So you have a, a, a self-autonomous biological clock. And um, why we like this clock in particular is that there's a direct link between this clock in the SCN and, and your eyes. So we can get light dark information from the environment and it will tell uh, this clock, it will synchronize and entrain this clock to your life on earth. And this is how you keep synchronized to um, life on earth. The other thing is that it's hardwired to the pineal gland, which produces a hormone called melatonin. And so even though we can't see what your SCN clock looks like, uh, we can measure this rhythm. And from this rhythm, which you see here on this slide, uh, melatonin occurs at night and depending on when it begins to rise, when it peaks and when it uh, drops, uh, you can get an idea of the timing of your SCN clock. So we, we're measuring the hand of a clock and this is used uh, a lot in, in our research. Uh, and so here you can see some circadian rhythms and you can see melatonin peaking at night. If uh, the peak is, is emphasized here by the dotted line, ve uh, very soon after the peak, you see your nadir of core body temperature, the lowest temperature you have in your body. Soon after that, you're at your lowest alertness. So you're extremely tired and sleepy and you have your worst task performance. Um, and this is to remind me that they're metabolites as well, 
that uh, have rhythms uh, in, in, in our bodies. Now, of course, when you stay up and do a night shift work, um, this is exactly where you are. You're at your worst performance and you're uh, most sleepy. Um, and so it's not ideal uh, to be working at that point. And this is one of the challenges, of course, of, of doing shift work. So what happens in shift work, if we think of uh, you, you, you're on your day shift and um, uh, melatonin is here at night, and then you move uh, to a uh, night shift when you're trying to sleep here during the day, which is not easy to do um, for any of you who've, who've uh, tried this. And you can see that over time, your melatonin rhythm uh, moves uh, and becomes adapted to your night shift. So at this point, you are adapted because your melatonin is being produced when you are sleeping. Uh, but it takes some days to, to get to that point. And th this is when you can have real problems. Uh, and uh, just to give you a real life example, we study oil rig workers in the North Sea, and they have these 14 days of day shift, and then they go on to a night shift of 14 days. And this is the melatonin metabolite that is peaking at night, as I explained to you. And then you can see here in the night shift, it starts off peaking at night around four in the morning, but then it slowly moves. So about day six, it is now more adapted uh, and it is peaking during the day. So you can adapt to uh, shift work. If it is for long enough, um, you, you can have adaptation. Now, the consequences of shift work essentially is you're struggling from sleep deprivation and you're struggling from uh, circadian rhythm desynchrony or misalignment. Um, now, sleep disturbances are the most commonly reported uh, ill effect of shift work. Uh, many, many shift workers complain about sleep problems. Their sleep duration is reduced. Uh, they struggle to fall asleep because they're trying to fall asleep during the day when their body is telling them they should be awake. And so it's difficult to fall asleep and stay asleep. So they have poor sleep quality. And it is one of the factors that make shift workers uh, give up and, and stop doing shift work. Uh, and then in addition to the poor sleep, when they're awake, they're not at their best either. They're very tired. Um, as we saw, uh, they are, have um, reduced alertness, reduced performance. And of course, this is exactly when you can have accidents and you can be a danger to yourself and to other people. And moving on to the sort of um, reduced performance, um, it, you have deficiencies in your memory, you can have increased error rates if you're in a factory and you're having to do uh, things. Um, it's harder to communicate. And one of the other things of sleep deprivation sometimes you have increased risk-taking behavior and your mood can change. Uh, some uh, a colleague uh, in uh, Australia uh, compared um, the lack uh, or the reduced performance that you get when you stay awake all night. So this is when you've been awake for over 19 hours here. You can see how poor your performance is and he related it to um, your blood alcohol concentration to get the message home that we shouldn't just focus on driving and how much you've been drinking. We should also focus on when you're driving, how long you've been awake and how tired you are because tiredness kills. And this slide has shows some of um, the road accidents that involve um, driver fatigue and that in fact, fatigue is more likely to cause problems and accidents at work than drugs and alcohol. 
Um, and when we're talking about um, not only being a cost to uh, ourselves, but of course a huge cost to society in terms of accidents, car accidents, fatigue related train accidents, ship accidents, aeroplane accidents, etc. And this was, uh, you know, over um, 10 years ago. So indeed, the cost has increased since then. Um, so that's the sort of immediate effects of doing staying up all night. Imagine tonight, you're going to stay up all night and, and, and trying to sleep the next day. But what about if you're chronically doing rotating shift work, um, like we have uh, studied in nurses, in uh, steel factory workers, in car factory workers. You have this chronic sleep restriction and chronic circadian desynchrony. And this is when you really see um, the adverse effects of, of doing this shift work. Now, these are epidemiology studies on large data sets showing all these references here and many more showing that if you do shift work, night shift work, you are at increased risk of some major diseases like cancer, cardiovascular disorders, type 2 diabetes, et cetera. Um, and um, this uh, more recent review took all the reviews, the meta-analyses and systematic reviews, over 60 of those, and, and reanalyzed all the data. And indeed, both shift work and short sleep increases your risk of diabetes, being overweight and stroke and coronary heart disease. So it, shift work is not good for your health. Um, now, the challenge we have, of course, um, is trying to work out how this is going on. What are the underlying physiological mechanisms that cause all this increased risk? Um, and, and then once we know that, whether we can try and design uh, intervention strategies to minimize this risk. And to do all that, we need to really be tracking uh, biological clocks in, and sleep, et cetera, in, in shift workers. So these are the challenges. Um, now, it's absolutely sure that these mechanisms are multifactorial. Um, it's not a single mechanism. Um, and, uh, and of course, what, um, what brings to mind then is that we, we now know that we don't just have the single clock in the brain. We, in fact, have clocks all over our body, just about every single tissue in our body, our heart, our liver, our pancreas, our skin have peripheral clocks. And these peripheral clocks, like in the liver, fat tissue, et cetera, um, are also involved in uh, this clock system. And it's critical that we have synchrony between all of these clocks and between our master clock in the SEN. So that the clock system then optimizes function. So as a human, uh, we need to be able to see during the day. We need to be able to metabolize food during the day. And we we'll need to be able to sleep at night. And the clock systems essentially do that. Now, um, the peripheral clocks, mo a lot of them are involved in metabolism, in the muscle, the liver, the gut, the pancreas, the white adipose tissue. These are all metabolic organs. And so it's absolutely clear now from the research lots of people have done that the clock system is partitioning uh, metabolic processes. So we are optimized to uh, be awake and eat during the day and to sleep and fast at night. And we have old studies and very recent studies reminding of us how critical it is that we should eat during the day and fast at night. Uh, these are animal studies, but you can see when animals 
are fed at the wrong time of the day, uh, they put on weight. Uh, and here, this is a human study that we did at Surrey, where we see that when we eat the same meal either in the day, this is the black lines, or we uh, the the black uh, and or if we eat the same meal at night, we get this raised um, triglycerides, so raised fat levels, and these are risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So this is not what you want to be eating uh, at midnight. And here's another uh, slide from our group where when we gave the meal before a shift, and then we gave the same meal during a shift uh, pattern, we got these increased uh, TAG levels, which again is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So it, it shows some relationships to start. Now, here is all the levels of misalignment you can get. And this slide is to show you how complicated it can be because we could have misalignment between the central clock and the peripheral clocks. We can have misalignment between the clock system and the light dark cycle or misalignment between when we sleep and when we're awake or when we're eating and when we're not. And then even at the level of one organ, one liver, we can get cells that are misaligned here. So it's a very complicated picture of um, uh, cells and clocks that might be misaligned when we do shift work. And this is really probably what is underlying all these adverse health consequences. Uh, now, to try and assess that, uh, we measure melatonin to get a, and cortisol to, to try and work out where the SCN clock is. But how are we going to, in humans, try to measure um, peripheral clocks? Now, people have taken bits of tissue from humans, and you can see some of the tissues here, bits of skin and hair. Uh, and uh, uh, what we've done at Surrey are these ones that are ringed here. Now, adipose tissue is quite handy because you can take little bits of a white adipose tissue uh, from this area of the body, and it is a metabolic tissue, uh, and you don't need surgery. So in our lab studies, we've been able to take samples uh, every six hours from volunteers, and then we can look at the clock gene, so we can look at this clock. So there is a clock in white adipose tissue. And we've also shown that indeed, when we change the timing of food, we can change the timing of these rhythms. Um, and when we look at the, uh, the rhythms in the blood cells, in the leukocytes, we didn't see an effect of uh, the food timing. So again, another complication, we're getting differential effects of uh, uh, food on the different clocks, which adds to this complication. Now, uh, we've recently published a paper to suggest that looking at the metabolome, so this is a whole lot of metabolites in plasma, might be a great way of uh, seeing human peripheral clocks. Uh, now, metabolomics is exactly uh, what that word means, is that you can measure over 200 metabolites in a single sample. We can look at how the, the metabolite rhythms are during the day and how they're affected by sleep deprivation. We've done all these studies. I don't have time to talk about them, but it provides a baseline to look at shift workers, which we're excited about. And here we did a simulated shift work study. So we had some people doing a day shift. So they sleep at night, work during the day, just like you're all doing. And then we had some in a night shift condition. So they were sleeping during the day and working at night. And then we took blood samples. And when we did that, we saw that the melatonin um, in um, the two night and day shifts hardly moves 
the message here is that the SEN clock is very hard to shift. It takes days um, to move in, in a night shift protocol, as does cortisol. It hardly moves across time. After three days, we hardly see it moving by more than 30 minutes. Whereas uh, when we look at the metabolite, so let me just orientate you here. Here's cortisol and here's melatonin, hardly moving between the day shift and the night shift condition. But the metabolites are really moving. Most of them, nearly 90% had significantly shifted rhythms. So when you look at that, what it means is that, for example, this metabolite is completely reversed in the day and night shift, after three nights of night shift. So we are very excited by that because it means that the metabolites might be reflecting the peripheral clocks and they are dissociated from the SEN clock and they're more aligning with the shifted sleep-wake cycle and the feeding-fasting cycle. So the metabolic profile might be a window, a way of seeing what your peripheral clocks are like. And hopefully that can also bring us into what the mechanisms might be. So in terms of strategies um, uh, now, what are the solutions? Well, the big solution for trying to uh, minimize the uh, effects of shift work, the obvious one is to not do shift work, but you'll realize that this is something that a lot of um, people can't do, like emergency services, nurses, doctors, firemen, etc. So we need solutions. And the way to look at it is, uh, what are the shift schedules? And do you need to adapt to that schedule or not? Now, uh, a lot of uh, rotating shifts are fast rotations. So two mornings, two afternoons, two nights. And for a short, fast rotation like that, you cannot adapt. The SCN melatonin rhythm will not adapt as shown in this slide here. You see here some early shifts. This is your melatonin peak at night. Then you go into late shifts and then you go into night shifts and nothing happens. The night shift, your melatonin at least, is still stuck and has not adapted. Uh, and to make matters worse, for example, here, when we studied our nurses, these are individual nurse shift schedules. There is no consistency. Sometimes they do two nights, another person does three nights, sometimes it's followed by a day off, sometimes it's not. You know, there is, there's no nurse that has a common shift schedule, which makes it even harder. To, to make solutions. So in a way, you're left with just trying to cope with helping this acute sleep deprivation that people suffer from. Um, and you heard, um, uh, so uh, if you wanna try and keep people awake at night so they don't make accidents, caffeine, uh, naps, you could uh, initiate naps on the night shift. You could have brighter light, uh, and there are drugs uh, that are registered for shift work sleep disorder, which I won't talk about or discuss. The other thing is to try and make the daytime sleep good quality. So a quiet, dark area, try and have no noise, no traffic noise, no children, etc. cetera. Uh, and some people use hypnotics and some people use melatonin. Um, this slide is to remind you that shift workers have a knock-on effect. Their, their schedules have a knock-on effect on their families and children that we shouldn't underestimate. Um, and it reminds me as well um, to remind us all that you know shift work isn't just a biological phenomenon, which I am focusing on today, I recognize, but it is about our societies. Do we need 24-hour 
supermarkets with shift workers. Um, uh, is that something we really need or not? So these are ethical questions. These are society questions. And then we definitely need more studies in how shift work might disrupt families, divorce rates, um, children, uh, feeding patterns, etc. So there's a lot to be done there. Now, shift workers, uh, the, some shift workers work permanent nights, and that's all very fine, but your problem is on your days off. Do you keep that night pattern? If you don't, then you're also having two days of desynchrony. Uh, and then you get long shift work patterns, um, and this might allow adaptation. And this is very much like the oil rig workers that we've studied, because they have these long patterns. And these long patterns mean you can uh, uh, try and hasten their adaptation. Uh, the other great thing about this uh, uh, oil rig workers is that, you know, it's like a lab in the sea because the, um, they, they don't have traffic noise, they don't have family or children disturbances, and so they are able to have better daytime sleep with darkened rooms. Now, the idea behind adaptation is that um, slowly over time, uh, you move, uh, you delay your clock. This is the melatonin rhythm, moving slowly and adapting to the night shift. And here is the peak time of melatonin, slowly adapting to the night shift. So that is possible if your night shift is long enough. Um, but the problem then is you have to readapt back uh, to a day shift or to your life back at home. So it's not um, perfect because you have to keep readapting backwards. And if you need to do that, then our field tells us from many studies by many research groups, including our own, that appropriately timed light and or melatonin can shift more quickly the circadian system to a new time zone or to a new work schedule. Um, the, if you want to optimize the effects of light, then you need to know that you can increase the intensity and the spectral composition should be more on the blue side. And you also need to get the timing right. So we know, and we were the first to show, in fact, that it's blue light that the circadian timing system responds to. Uh, lots of people have confirmed the study now. Um, and we know, of course, that lighting, that look at the lighting above you as you're listening to me, depends on whether you have tungsten lights, fluorescent lights, or LED, because the spectral composition and the amount of blue uh, varies. But it means you can design your work environment. And we have indeed, this is um, some um, steel uh, factory workers in Belgium where we changed the lighting in their control rooms, and that improved their visual comfort and performance compared to the, the older, darker room. Um, and the recent studies that I've been collaborating on where uh, if you have short wavelength blue light during the night shift, you can improve performance and have fewer errors. So getting the timing right is, is, is a bit more difficult um, because uh, it's complicated because both can delay the clock and advance the clock, depending on when you give it. Uh, now, if we just focus down here, this is a westward flight. So if you want to get those athletes flying westward or you're on a shift work where you're going from day to night, can you see here you need to delay, you need to delay your clock to make it later and to delay your clock you need to have light uh, in the evening and melatonin in the morning. And then if you want to do eastward flight, or if you want to go from a night shift to a day shift, you need to advance your rhythms here. And to advance your rhythms, you need 
to have melatonin in the evening and light in the morning. So uh, it's just complicated, but possible if you, if you know these things. And so you can have the time bright light and melatonin, and then also always try and have a quiet deep sleeping area. And we've done this uh, with all rig workers when they get back home, uh, and we've shown a beneficial effect of sleep using timed light. Um, now, just a few last minutes to say why we're we so excited, because of course, we really need to study real life shift workers. And the challenge is how can you do that while they're working? And uh, I'm pleased to say that we, uh, co I'm collaborating with colleagues who have this interesting device where you can uh, sample interstitial fluid from your stomach every 20 minutes. It's painless, it's stress-free, and people can walk around with it. And we can get samples including during sleep and during the shift work. And we can measure in there melatonin, cortisol, and these metabolites. And here you see a single person, uh, there are their meals, there's their sleep, and you see how we can track, uh, this is one metabolite, but we can track the metabolites in the tissue fluid, as well as in plasma, and you see how well they mirror. So. We're very excited by that uh, because we can uh, look at different metabolites, ambulatory monitoring. And then this, of course, combined with the kind of devices that Sarah was talking about, where you can measure uh, the light, where you can measure skin temperature, you can measure rest activity. Some people call that sleep, but we call it rest activity you can get an idea of the behavior. And so uh, we're going to be able to monitor these rhythms. This means that we can then see what the effect of the different shift work schedules are on the system. And the idea being that then we can design healthier schedules to minimize this circadian misalignment that you see. And so I'll end by thanking, I thank lots of people and my colleagues along the way. These are my current collaborators and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was really fascinating. And as a non-scientist, I really appreciated your ability to translate that work and make it um, more accessible for us as well. Um, that was great. There's so much to talk about. Um, yeah. It's time for questions. Uh, we'll be taking a speakers list in the chat. So if you put your name in there, we'll just keep an order and uh, call on you. Um, if anyone wants to jump in, that's great. But um, I certainly have a lot of, of questions for you both. Um, maybe I could start with a kind of more general question that I think is really related to the theme of our talk today. And that's um, this tension that emerges between the sleeper as person and the sleeper as worker. Um, maybe I'll just start with this for Deborah. Um, you were talking about, for example, night shift workers. And I'll just say, like, I vividly remember the first time I came across a study that said, you know, shift work can take 10 years off your life in a newspaper. And my mom is a intensive care nurse who worked the nights. I mean, I remember sitting reading that and crying because I had never thought about the impact of that on her health. Um, even as I saw it in everyday life. Um, and you mentioned some mitigating factors like bright lights, melatonin, I think there was another medication, and napping. And I actually wanted to ask you about napping and how, um, how we might understand some of the differences between these modes of interventions and interventions and, um, and data collection that's geared towards um, improving worker performance versus improving people's quality of life. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that tension in the, in the research. Yes, indeed, indeed it is a tension, I agree with you. Um, I'll, you know, I like the napping idea. Uh, we, we've recently written a review uh, looking at napping uh, and uh, uh, what they call fatigue um, uh, um, strategies to eliminate fatigue in nurses. And, you know, you'd think quite a simple thing might be that shift working, night shift workers 
they would be allowed to nap uh, while they work or have a, a, a break where they could just have a, a power nap. Uh, but this is absolutely, well, at least I'll speak for the UK, this is absolutely not allowed or at least not admitted. Maybe nurses do nap, but, but a power nap or a time for a power nap within a, a night shift schedule, just some sort of recovery, like they advise, for example, when you pull off on the motorway to have a 10 minute nap uh, and a cup of coffee, just to um, you know, have your, your immediate relief from the power nap and then the, the caffeine could, could kick in, uh, just to keep you awake and not, not do errors. Um, uh, and that doesn't, you know, uh, well, at least the napping doesn't involve drugs. So I, I would definitely propose something like that. Uh, another thing would be a light shower. So if you're in a dark environment at night where nurses um, can't wake the patients, then when you have a break, you go into a, a room that's quite bright with light, blue enriched light, quite bright um, to, to make you more alert. So, so these are sort of what I'd call non-pharmacological, non-drug ideas. Can I just briefly ask a follow-up about that in terms of data monitoring? I mean, how much does the, the, um, the current research on shift workers follow people after they've completed their career? Ha, huh. yes. Well, much less work than, 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 than should, of course, that is a big gap in, in the study. And, and why, why do, um, you know, what, another interesting part is what makes, people leave shift work um, uh, because those that carry on uh, we wonder whether they are people who can really cope with it and we we do know their individual differences to coping with uh, uh, flying across time zones and shift work and maybe they're the healthy workers that survive they're the so you're getting the survivor effect so we always need to bear this in mind when we looking at papers about shift workers, maybe they're the survivors and we lost the people that couldn't survive. And, and that's a huge gap. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's part of the emphasis of this research project is to address these questions of equity and what it means to live with risk. Um, so I, I really appreciate these thoughts. Um, I see we have a question from Josiane also for Deborah, which I will read for her in a second, but maybe I'll just turn to Sarah for one minute um, to sure. just follow up on this idea of um, workers versus people. I was struck by your anecdote about LeBron James, I think it was, or, or Kobe Bryant, who was saying, now that I'm a dad, I need to take care of my sleep. Um, <laughs> Very interesting uh, uh, in those terms, but I wanted to ask, I know you've done work on college athletes as well, and um, athletes in general, I think one of the things that um, makes them very fascinating and even models for the contemporary ideas that we have around sleep and the 24 hour body um, is also in part the way that athletes sometimes aren't necessarily seen as workers or laborers. Um, I think particularly think about college athletics in this way, which are incredibly exploitative, even as they're you know, tied to high performance and potential. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the difficulty in understanding athletes as workers um, and how that impacts what it means to research their sleep. Thank you. Uh, what a great question. And I think you've really tapped into this uh, tension around amateurism that is uh, per perhaps at its most uh, sort of extreme in the NCAA, um, but also probably in Canada as well in our system. Um, and I think this does go back to sort of longstanding ideas about amateurism and sort of sport as a place to build character uh, and to create workers and ideal citizens who sort of have the right priorities. Um, so I, th I think you're really tapping into this. And I, I think um, I'm also thinking of some of the work of Mary McDonald, who's a great scholar, a mentor of mine, who she has sort of looked at how biomedical interventions in the NCAA can also um, deflect attention away from these questions about exploitative work conditions. So the way that health and wellness actually gets mobilized to not have conversations about exploitation um, in sport. So I think it's really important not to understand health and wellness as somehow separate from power society. Um, and when I'm thinking of 
um, Meg Brown's work, Megan Brown's work, who's done some really great stuff about how sleeping and napping has really been taken up in corporate America. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not separate from uh, questions of power and discipline and, and simply another route to make people more um, productive. So I think that's what's slippery about this is yes, um, you absolutely want to be um, coping better within systems, um, but the, then you get integrated more deeply into that system as well. So it's very tricky. Thanks so much. There's certainly no easy <laughs> response to that particular <laughs> paradox. Um, I'm going to ask Josiane's question now, just for Deborah. Um, Josiane writes, uh, my comment is not about changing shifts, but night shifts specifically. The premise seems to be that humans are diurnal by nature, while about 20% of the population are night owls. Would not that be true that for night owls, there would be no circadian rhythm disruption at night? Great question. Um, and that they were to su suffer comparable negative effects if they were on to the contrary to work the day shift. So I guess a question about kind of um, diversity of experiences um, amongst data sets. Yes, thank you for that question because it's reminded me <laughs> to mention chronotype um, and night owls and 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 indeed um, uh, there are now interesting studies where um, they are matching shift schedule to um, the chronotype so so a mm. person who's a night owl uh, does does the night shifts and somebody who's a, a an early morning uh, lock um, does the morning shift to see whether that helps minimize the circadian misalignment which indeed in theory it should it certainly um, the, the the reports on these early studies are positive but unfortunately, uh, the night owls, they're not absolutely reversed in terms of their chronotype. They're later than um, the population, as, as you say, they're on the edges of the normal distribution, but they are not suited to, to be working, um, you know, sort of from 2300 to 08. Uh, the first part of the night, they'll be fine, but then they, they would be misaligned as well. It's, it's not an absolute reversal. Um, but to come to your question about uh, night workers, perhaps, you know, people do select, we've often talked about whether people select the jobs and the careers that they have. So, for example, uh, you know, when I worked uh, with a theatre group um, and they worked mm. their theatres at night and... Uh, you know, we all put our chronotypes in the program and every single one of the sound engineers and the producer and all the actresses and everyone, they were all late types and I'm a late type and I'm an academic. Uh, and it's because we don't have to get up at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, um, so, so I think people might choose their jobs and it might be that indeed some night workers are late types just just because they they can cope with it but then of course there are others and this comes to a different question about shift workers there are people that unfortunately because of their financial situation work nights you get paid uh, quite well and it means you can also still take care of your children so so there really is a um an issue there about you know, why people do shift work, if they know it's bad for their health, why are they doing it? And why, why take that risk? Uh, and that is often about money. And, and so that really comes to deep into other issues about society. Anyone else has questions? Um, you could put your name in the chat or you could raise your hand. I think I can see everybody now. Um, I guess one of the things that both of your, um, your presentations are making me think about is the future of work as well. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a person who works a lot on sci-fi. <laughs> I couldn't help but think about the figure of the cyborg you know, rooted in these early explorations of, of going to outer space, for example, but whether the, the athlete is a figure from the image that you showed, um, Sarah, of the, from the Harvard fatigue lab, um, whether the athletes are these kind of proto-cyborgs at earlier moments in the kind of 24-hour 
um, completely modulatable human being. Um, but I wonder if um, you have some thoughts on this, on the future of work. Um, increasingly, it seems that, you know, the 24 hour clock is something that all workers are being asked to live with. Um, but uh, Deborah, you know, you were thinking about these kind of mods that, that people might be able to use and, and to adapt. I imagine many of them are done in a very DIY fashion right now by shift workers. Um, do you see that as something that's going to be increasingly incorporated into um, uh, labor practices, not as a DIY kind of thing, but actually as part of how we think about the, the conditions of labor? Um, in the same way that we're all being, you know, asked to buy work at home <laughs> computer stands and things like that. Yes, I, I think um, you know, I do, there, there are things that we, we think we can do now. Um, for example, if we could try and uh, one, healthy, one, uh, one healthy thing needs to be tested a bit more, but it's because we now understand the role of food timing and, and the, we know that sleeping at the wrong time, eating at the wrong time is, is not good for you. And that's what it's all about. It is this... Um, uh, and so uh, it would be to try and not eat too much during the middle of the night. Uh, and so try and restrict the eating, if you can, to a, a sort of what I would call a normal wake period. So if you wake up at seven and go to bed at 2300 normally, try and eat within that, even though you're doing the night shift work. So that you don't have a big fat meal, you know, three, four in the morning because we, we know the tags go up, you, you metabolize that really badly and, and it could build up and you get put on weight, et cetera. So, you know, those are things that could, could, be, could be done in, you know, people might want to try that uh, because it's, you can change your behavior a bit and it's not costly. Uh, and we think if with enough proof, it might be, it might minimize some of these things. This is a long way to go, but, but this is where the research is leading. This is the sort of general idea about designing healthier schedules. Um, it's, it's what you do at night when you're on, on the night shift and how you try and uh, make a, your sleep better quality during the day, et cetera. So, you know, th that's where we're going, going with it. Um, uh, I don't know, did I ask, answer your question now? <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting to think about then how this becomes available to workers as well. Um, I mean, Sarah, I was thinking about athletes and the fact that their careers are often so compressed, so radically compressed. They're, they're not usually athletes in that way for you know, 40, 50 years. Sometimes it's as few as you know, 10 years or something like that. And that compression, I think, also gives us a window often into the future. Um, yeah. Uh, at the kind of cutting edge of sleep management. Do you have some thoughts about the future of work? Um, yeah, I was very I was very interested. That sort of relates to your comment before about how long we follow shift workers after. I think that's such an interesting um, point. Um, I'm not sure I have ideas about the future of work, but I do, I, I've, I've recently been thinking a lot about the WNBA, which is the Women's National Basketball Organization. And this is um, one sports setting that has a pretty interesting active union and so partly what they're doing is thinking about the conditions of work currently they sort of have um i don't want to get too much into this paper but they they are doing interesting things to think about um, family planning health benefits um right now they fly commercial versus um, men's teams fly private jets and so trying to actually think about the structural issues um, and and they're approaching it through unionized work um, what's interesting though is how or complicated is how um, there are efforts to um, create better working conditions for these athletes and how sleep technology is also a part of that conversation and how efforts to politicize recovery um, get a little bit complicated when you are um, using sort of disciplinary and sleep tracking technologies. So it's sort of this complicated mix of, um, I think the WNBA is doing a great job of politicizing recovery in um, that can be a broader um, thing that's incorporating about gender equity, pay, and um, all these other aspects that affect sleep. So, yes. That is fascinating. Oh. Sorry, Deborah, were you gonna say something? 
Yeah, yes, may I? Um, the future of work, I was thinking one, one advantage of us all having online jobs and being able to zoom in and out of things is that we could avoid a, quite a lot of shift work uh, because, of course, as you know, when you phone, uh, you know, your helpline, you might have a voice that is 12 hours uh, away. So th they're working day, uh, let's say the Philippines, they're working day shifts in the Philippines to answer your calls in the middle of the night. So we don't need, uh, you know, Canada people doing night shifts to answer your calls. You, you just, you know, can get a call from, from another place where they're on day shifts. So, so that is, you know, quite a nice revolution uh, in that uh, we can avoid some of the, the, the night working that, that was happening in situ. That's a great point to think about kind of the global characteristic. Um, we've often thought of it in negative terms of the 24 hour cycle, making everything kind of relentlessly paced, but we could think maybe about what it would take to make that a, a factor for, for thinking about um, labor equity. I have a question here from Josh who asks, do naps have a significant impact on metabolite or hormonal rhythms, or is it just a subjective sense of rest and recovery that they provide? Uh, yeah. So um, uh, na naps are feeding straight into um, uh, the, home the sleep homeostatic process and, and relieving that sleep pressure. Um, uh, so uh, with, it only has an effect on hormones and metabolites by virtue of the fact that you close your eyes when you sleep. Uh, and for that time, then you won't have a light signal uh, going to your clock and that could uh, change the rhythms that you're measuring. But it's only because you're closing your eyes uh, when you sleep and when you nap. Uh, the nap really is to, to reduce the homeostatic sleep pressure and it can be done in 10 minutes. Uh, so, you know, I, I, do, I do feel it, it, it's something that, um, uh, some sh businesses sh should allow at night. Thanks, Josh. Um, does anyone else have a question? I have a, I, I can ask Deborah a question. Yes, and I, and I can also. <laughs> yeah. um, Deborah, have, have you ever, um, clearly you've done so much work in like across a variety of sectors. Have you ever, um, thought about working with athletes <laughs> or uh, <laughs> the sport world? No. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I, it's because it's recorded, I won't say, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, um, no, uh, uh, case studies and, and athletes. And uh, yes, a lot of people make a lot of money uh, advising different groups and uh, professionals to do this, that and the other. But no, I, I'm sticking to staying in my lab. Uh, yeah. There, there are other people that that uh, feel they can do that, uh, um, but I guess they they've read all of our research and others, and so they know what to do. Uh, yeah. uh, but but to to ask a question back to you uh, when you were talking about, of course, these devices, uh, you know, my question and the sleep research fields question is always how valid are they you know people look at their iphones and they say they've had you know 60 night awakenings it's it's absolute rubbish um you know uh we uh all, you know i would always question is the device really measuring what it's saying it is and how does it compare with the gold standard uh sleep recordings etc um so so we we're very skeptical uh, as a as a field, well, or you could argue that we're protecting our field. Um, uh, do you know what I mean? But how reliable and valid is it? Yeah. So, just a few comments are coming to mind uh, in the sleep sort of sport research area. Um, a lot of reporting actually in these studies doesn't necessarily include uh, ideas of validity. Like that information is just not there, so it's hard to verify. And when I'm thinking about the commercial realm, there's often appeals to the military uh, and to this as a legitimizing force of how powerful um, some devices are. 
Um, so they do claim to sort of go above and beyond an Apple or a device, but um, yeah, so there is quite a big range of variation. And um, I haven't um, tracked my own sleep in part, like just to keep a little bit of separation from all, from always being about sleep. And so I know that um, people do find that there's uh, such variation and uh, that would undermine these technologies in other ways too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. one, one of the things I remember um, was this joke sort of when these sort of new technologies were first being uh, rolled out in sport, there was a segment on Hockey Night in Canada uh, which is a very big program in Canada. And they sort of did this in focus feature on sleep researchers and, and this kept te te technology. And one of the, um, one of the players like held up his wrist and he was saying that he was going to wear all his teammates, uh, <laughs> like sleep watches while they went out and had a good time. <laughs> he was going to stay in the hotel. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there's just all these funny little anecdotes and yeah, yeah. that's a good one for me to yeah, end on. <laughs> yeah. But, but the last comment I'd like to make, cause it, it does feed into your comment about ethics and that, and, and that was, you know, it's, it's, it's when, you know, what worries me about this winning at sleep, which I think you described really well, that it has completely changed to now that people know sleep is good for you. Um, what about the people who can't? Uh, and of course, there are a lot of people who suffer yeah. from insomnia and, and now they feel like more like failures. And, and this, this, this is, you know, not, not what we wanted. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that nails it right up. Like the competition creates winners and losers and um, in many different ways. And so, yeah, I think this is exactly right. And how um, bizarre a way to think about sleep that is. Like it's a very historically specific way of even approaching this idea. So yeah, mm -hmm. it has consequences. Mm -hmm. Well, we're out of time, but thank you both so much for wonderful talks um, with a lot for us to think about, um, in particular, um, to continue the conversation that we're having, particularly around the equities of sleep. Um, our next salon is uh, February 2nd at 11 a.m. And partly we have a time shifting uh, winter salon series because we're increasingly working with international speakers. Um, so that's going to be on performing sleep. And on January 28th, we also have a graduate research colloquium, so next generation of sleep researchers, um, which is unfortunately, but also fortunately going to be on Zoom. All of that information is available on our website. Shailen has shared all the links in the chat. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for being here. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to Shailen and to Josh for uh, helping to organize this event. And um, have a great day. Thanks. Everybody, Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.